Hi and welcome, I'm Gavin Lon. After the completion of the Blazor WebAssembly course, I wanted to create something completely different. So this tutorial demonstrates how to build a basic card game using vanilla JavaScript, basic CSS, and HTML code. This tutorial not only covers creating a basic card game using JavaScript, but also covers how to create dynamic, user-interactive code using vanilla JavaScript. We'll cover creating some animation effects, responsive layout design using CSS Grid, CSS Flexbox, and media queries. How to dynamically change the positions of grid cells so as to randomize the positions of the cards contained in a CSS Grid using JavaScript, local storage, and much more. I would say that the code is accessible to learners at most levels. I've kept the code quite simple. If, however, you get lost at any point, the code can be downloaded from GitHub. Please see a link below in the description to the relevant GitHub repository. In this video, we are going to develop a basic card game using vanilla JavaScript. I'll use VS Code as my code editor. Even though I'll develop the game on my Mac, you, of course, can use VS Code for Windows or Linux, and the coding experience will be very much the same. VS Code is, of course, free open source software. I'll be using the Chrome browser for testing purposes. So the game that we'll develop is very basic. I've called it Hunt the Ace. Here's a brief description of the game. So we have four different cards, one of which is the Ace of Spades. The user clicks the play game button to start the game. The cards are flipped over so that the user can no longer see the face of the cards. Our game then randomizes the positions of the cards. So the cards are, in effect, shuffled. The cards are then positioned at random locations in a grid layout. Each location corresponds to a random whole number between one and four. The user can then guess where the user thinks the ace of spades is by clicking on the relevant card. Once the user has clicked the chosen card, the card then flips over and of course the user is made aware of whether the user has guessed the correct position of the ace of spades. Each game consists of four rounds. In each round, the user attempts to guess the location of the ace of spades. If the user fails to guess the position of the ace of spades, the user will not be awarded any points for that round. If the user, however, guesses the correct location of the ace of spades, the user is awarded points based on the round number. So yes, it's a simple game, but I thought this might be a good JavaScript coding exercise. This code is fairly simple, and therefore this tutorial should be accessible to a wide audience interested in programming. If you like this video, please hit the like button. For content like this and much more, please consider subscribing and please ring the bell so that you'll be notified of future content. If you'd like to thank me by buying me a coffee, I've included a link to my Buy Me A Coffee webpage. Any support will be greatly appreciated. Please note that I've included links below in the description to additional information for more detail on certain concepts discussed in this tutorial. Let's create the project. So let's get started. So all we need to do is open an empty folder from within Visual Studio Code. This folder is of course where our project files will reside. So I've created a folder which I have aptly named Hunt the Ace to house the files for this project on my computer. Let's create three files within Visual Studio Code. Let's create a file named index.html, of course, for our HTML code. Let's create a file named index.js, of course, for our JavaScript code. Let's create a file named style.css, of course, for our layout and styling code, our CSS code. Let's create a folder to house the images that will be used to represent our cards, as well as a card that will be used for our game's image logo. You can download the relevant images from GitHub at this location. 
Great. The live server extension. Let's start by coding basic HTML code. So within Visual Studio Code, you can generate boilerplate HTML code. For example, the doc type tag that indicates that we are using HTML5, the HTML tag, head and body tags, along with relevant meta tags by simply typing in the exclamation mark character followed by pressing the tab key, like this. So I'm going to use semantic HTML to create a tag named header, which will house header-related HTML code in our layout. By semantic HTML, I mean the tag name is descriptive as to the purpose of the tag, rather than, for example, simply using a div tag. Semantic HTML elements are those that clearly describe their meaning in a human-readable and machine-readable way. So we can type the tag name and then press the tab key and the code for the HTML element is generated for us by Visual Studio Code. Let's include a div element that contains a CSS class named header-title-container. So a quick way to generate the HTML code for the relevant tag that includes a specific class attribute within Visual Studio Code is to type the tag name, so div, then type in a dot followed by the class name you wish to include within the element. Then simply press the tab key and Visual Studio Code automatically generates the desired HTML code. Let's include a h1 element for our game's header. So we want our header to reflect the name of the game we are creating, so hunt the ace. You may be familiar with a Visual Studio Code extension named Live Server. If you are not familiar with this extension, it is very useful for monitoring the effects of changes made to your code in real time. You can install the Live Server extension from this location. So once the Live Server extension has been installed, we can launch our application through Visual Studio Code using Live Server like this. We can then tile our code editor to the left of our screens and our browser to the right of our screens and in this way we can easily monitor the effects of changes to our code without the need to refresh the browser window every time we make a change to our code. So for example, let's change our header text to hunt the ace of spades. And once we have saved our code we can immediately see the effects of our code change within the browser window. Create cards statically with card 3D CSS effects. So we are first going to create a card statically. Then later we'll dynamically generate the cards through JavaScript code. We'll appropriately use the document object model to build our cards and add them to the DOM document object model. Let's first create the card statically through basic HTML and CSS code. Let's create a div tag that contains a class named card-container. Within this div tag, let's create a child div element that contains a class named card. Within the card div element, let's create a child div element that contains a class named card-inner. Within the card-inner div element, let's create a child div element that contains a class named card-front. Let's also create a child div element that contains a class named card-back Let's add an image element as a child element to the div element that contains the class named card-front. As you may have guessed, this image will represent the front of the card. So let's assign the image element's source tag the path of the image that depicts the jack of clubs. So each card will contain the same back image. So we can ensure this by adding the appropriate image element as a child element to the div tag that contains the card-back class, like this. So we have built our card statically using HTML code. As you can see, there's not much to look at at present. So the next step 
is to style the card using CSS code so that we can create our card to look three-dimensional and create the desired flip effect. Our CSS code will create the illusion that the card is a three-dimensional object. Let's first reference our style.css file from within the index.html file. I'm not going to go into too much detail explaining the CSS code because this tutorial is more about JavaScript. Please follow along with the code so that your CSS code is consistent with mine. Let's create the styling for the card-container element. By card-container element, I am of course referring to the element that contains a reference to the card-container CSS class. Let's create the styling for the card element. Let's create CSS variables to store the dimensions of our cards. So basically the card dash inner element contains the child elements card dash back and card dash front. The CSS code we are creating facilitates a flip effect between the front of the card and the back of the card. We can test the flip effect by implementing CSS code so that when we hover our mouse pointers over the relevant card that the flip effect occurs. So we are writing code so that the inner dash card element rotates 180 degrees on its Y axis when a mouse pointer is hovered over the relevant card. And we can now test this. Excellent. Before we create our cards dynamically through JavaScript code, and appropriately add the cards to the document object model, let's create a grid for the game area, if you like, where the cards will be placed. So firstly, let's create four placeholders denoting the positions of each of the cards in the gameplay area. So card-pause-a, card-pause-b, card-pause-c, and card-pause-d. So you can see here in the CSS code, I've given the body element a height of 100 VH. This simply means the height of the body of the HTML document will take up 100% of the viewport height of the screen. So I want the gameplay area to be aligned centrally within the main element and take up an area based on the width of the cards. So let's write the code for this. So I'm using Flexbox functionality for the display to centrally align the gameplay area, i.e. the area that will contain our cards. 
So I'm going to use the calc CSS function to calculate the width of the gameplay area. Two cards will reside side by side on each row. The card dash container style essentially denotes the gameplay area. Then to display the cards in a grid that will have two cards on each row, we can use the grid functionality provided in CSS. We can control where each individual card will reside by allocating each card position element a position in the grid by using the grid-template-areas property like this. So, to get a clear picture of our layout, let's add border styles to the relevant HTML elements. Great. Let's give each of the grid cells different background colors so that we can get a clear picture of the layout of the grid. Note that each of the four cards used in this game will be placed in a specific cell within the grid. Great and we can see the grid cells clearly. So we have now created the grid within the gameplay area. Create cards dynamically through JavaScript. We have created our cards statically through HTML and CSS. Let's create the cards dynamically using JavaScript. Let's go to our index.js file. Let's create an array of objects. Each object within the array denotes a card or a card definition. Each object has an ID property and an image path property. The first item is the king of hearts and has an ID of one. The second item is a jack of clubs and has an ID of two. The third item is the queen of diamonds and has an ID of three. The fourth item is the ace of spades and has an ID of four. Let's create a function named createCard. Of course, this function is responsible for creating a card dynamically through JavaScript code. Firstly, let's create a reusable function responsible for creating a HTML element. Let's name this function createElement. We can create a HTML element in code through this line of code. Let's use our createElement method to create the div tags that make up a card. So here we can see the static HTML code that we created earlier to represent a card. So that we can see what we are creating here in code dynamically. So basically we have a card element, an inner card element within the card element, a front and back element within the inner card element.
we can use the create element method to create our image elements that contain the back card image and the front card image. Let's create a reusable method that adds a class to a HTML element. Let's write code to add the card class to the card element. Let's write a method that adds an ID to a HTML element. So each card will be assigned a unique ID. The ID will come from the array of card object definitions that we created earlier. Our create card method accepts one argument. This argument will be an item from the card object definitions array. Let's write code to add the inner card class to the inner card element. Let's write code to add the appropriate class to the front dash card element and the back card element. Let's write a reusable method that assigns a path for the relevant image to the SRC attribute of an image element. Okay, before we assign the image path, properties for the card to the appropriate image elements, let's create a const to store the path for the image that represents the back of a card. Right, let's assign the image paths appropriately. Let's write code to assign the card-image class to the image elements. So now that we have our basic elements created in code, let's assign the child elements appropriately to their parent elements. So let's create a reusable method named addChildElement. The code within this method simply adds the child element passed in as an argument to the second parameter to the parent element passed in as an argument to the first parameter. So let's write code to add the image elements to their appropriate parent elements.
Let's write code to add the front dash card element and the back dash card element to the inner dash card element. Let's write code to add the inner dash card element to the card element. Let's create a global const and store a reference to the card dash container element. We are not going to add the card elements directly to this element, but we will use this element constant a bit later when we write code to alter the positions of the grid cells. Each grid cell will contain one of our cards. The cells of the grid are child elements of the card container element. We are using the CSS grid system for the grid functionality, which represents the gameplay area, i.e. where our cards will be displayed. Let's write code to appropriately add each card element as a child element to their appropriate grid cell. Each grid cell is denoted by a div element. We are going to map each card to its initial position by mapping the card element's ID to the appropriate element that represents a grid cell. This is how our code will know, as it were, which card must be assigned to which positional parent div element. So let's create a method named add card to grid cell. Let's create a method named map card ID to grid cell. This method will be called within the add card to grid cell method. So if the card ID is one, we want this card to be added as a child element to the first position in the grid, which is denoted by a div element with the card pos a CSS class. If card ID is two, we want this card to be added as a child element to the second position in the grid, which is denoted by a div element with the card-pos-b CSS class. If card ID is three, we want this card to be added as a child element to the third position in the grid, which is denoted by a div element with the card-pos-c CSS class. If card ID is four, we want this card to be added as a child element to the fourth position in the grid, which is denoted by a div element with the card pos d CSS class. Then within the add card to grid cell method, let's write the code that finds the appropriate parent element for the child card element using the map grid ID to grid cell method and then adds the child card element to its designated parent element. Then within the create card method, let's write code to appropriately call the add card to grid cell method. So let's write a method that will loop through each of the objects stored within the card object definitions array, create the relevant cards and add the cards to their appropriate grid positions. So let's create a method named create cards. Then all we need to do is write code that calls the create card method within the for each loop that loops through each card definition to create the cards dynamically and add the cards to their appropriate position within the grid. Let's test the code. Okay, so we have an issue. Let's press F12 within our Chrome browsers. And card is not defined. Okay. And it's because I forgot to include an appropriate parameter 
that expects a card element as an argument within the map card ID to grid cell method definition. Okay, and it's still not adding the cards to the grid. If we press F12 and inspect the elements, it's definitely adding the cards to the grid cells. Ah, but the image element is not built correctly. Okay, so the code is currently adding the images to the front and back div elements, whereas the code should be adding the images to the front and back image elements. So let's fix this issue. Oh, and I can see that the card image class is being added to the div elements rather than the image elements, which is of course incorrect. This class should be added to the appropriate image elements, not the div elements. Great. So let's modify the CSS code so that the cards align centrally within the grid cells. And let's use the CSS Flexbox functionality to align the cards centrally within their parent elements. Great. So we have now created our cards dynamically through JavaScript code and positioned the cards appropriately within their grid cells. Let's write a method named load game. The method is called when the game is first launched. So we want our cards to be created dynamically when the game is first launched. So let's call the create cards method from within the load game method. Let's write a method named start game. This method will be called when a user clicks a button used for starting a game. The gameplay button if you like. Let's go to our HTML file and include a button element that the user can click to start the game. Let's first write layout related code for our button. And then let's code the button element itself. Let's write code to create a global variable that will store a reference to an array of the card elements. Then let's write code to assign the results of a query for all card elements to our cards global array variable within the load game method. Let's write code to wire up a click event to the start game button element that we just created within our HTML code. Let's first write code to store a reference to our start game button element in a global const. Within the load game method, let's use the JavaScript method addEventListener to add a click event handler to the start game button. 
when a user clicks the start game button, we want the start game function to be called. So let's test whether our event listener is working. Great. Let's write a definition for a method that will be called to initialize a new game. Let's write a definition for a method that will be called when a new round is started. Let's write a definition for a method that will initialize a new round. Let's call the start round method from within the start game method. So when the user clicks the start game button, and before the cards are shuffled, i.e. their positions are randomized, we want the user to see the cards stacked one on top of the other and positioned centrally within the gameplay area, i.e. the grid. So to achieve this, we are going to first collapse the grid, as it were. The collapse grid functionality simply involves modifying the grid area template property. So the grid consists of just one cell. Then our code will add the cards to this one cell. So to achieve this, let's first create a method named collect cards. Let's create a constant to store the grid area templates value that will be assigned to the grid area templates property to cause the grid to collapse as it were. Let's create a global constant that stores the class of the div element that represents the grid cell that will be the only cell in the grid once we modify the grid area templates property appropriately. So we are choosing the first cell in the grid to contain our stacked cards, as it were. So within the collect cards method, let's call a method named transform grid area and pass the appropriate global constant we have just declared as an argument to the transform grid area method. Let's write the transform grid area method. So using the card container elem element that contains the grid cells, this element has been designated through appropriate CSS code as our grid. Let's change its grid template areas property through implementing the appropriate JavaScript code like this. Then let's write a method to add the cards to the cell that at this point takes up the entire grid. So the grid now consists of only one cell. Let's call our add cards to grid area cell method from within the collect cards method. Let's call the collect cards method from within the start round method. Let's test the code. Excellent. So before the shuffle cards process begins, we want to flip the cards so that the backs of the cards are facing the user. So firstly, let's update the CSS code so that when the inner card div element also contains a card named flip it, that the UI responds by rotating the card on its Y axis by 180 degrees, i.e. the flip it class being present in the relevant cards inner card element 
results in the card flipping from front to back, as it were. So let's go to our JavaScript code and create a method named flip cards. This method contains one parameter. If the card is on its front and the flip to back argument is true, our code will flip the card so that its back is facing the user. So let's create a method named flip card. This method accepts two arguments. The first argument will store the relevant card element. The second argument will contain the Boolean flip to back value. So as we know at this stage, the inner card element is the element that is used for creating the flip effect. So the inner element is the first child contained within the card element. So we can use the relevant card element's first child property to reference the inner card element. The logic for this method is as follows. If the flip to back argument is true and the inner card element doesn't contain the flip it class, then add the flip it class to the inner card element. So if the card is already back facing, we don't want to flip the card so that it is front facing. Flip to back is true, so we want the card to have its back facing the user. Else, if the inner card element contains the flip it class, we want to remove it. The result of this will mean that the card is flipped so that the card's front is facing the user. If the card is already facing front side up, it will not contain the flip it class, which is what we want in this case. Within the flip it cards method, let's call the flip card method appropriately so that all cards are traversed and flipped as it were, if appropriate. Let's use the JavaScript set timeout method so that each card is flipped at a different time. This is done just to create a simple animation effect. So each flip will occur at an interval measured in milliseconds, which will be the index a sequential value from 1 to 4 incremented with each iteration of the loop, multiplied by 100. So let's call the flip cards method from within the start round method after the collect cards method. We want the cards flipped on their backs, so the flip to back argument passed to the flip cards method is set to true. Let's test the code. Excellent. So now we want to randomize the positions of the cards. So let's create a method named shuffle cards. We are going to use JavaScript's set interval method to run a function that we'll create in a bit named shuffle. So every 12 milliseconds, the shuffle method will execute. Let's use a variable named shuffle count to count the amount of times the shuffle method is called. When the shuffle count variable is equal to 500, we can use JavaScript's clear interval method to stop the shuffle method being called. The shuffle count variable is incremented every time the shuffle function is called. We are going to create a method to randomize the positions of the cards. Within the shuffle function, let's call a method named randomize card positions. Right, so let's write the randomize card positions method. So let's use JavaScript's math.random functionality appropriately so that we generate a random whole number between 1 and 4. 
We want two random numbers generated. Let's create a global variable that stores an array of card positions within the grid. Then we can use these two random numbers to swap the position values for the relevant cards within the card positions array. This creates a shuffle like effect for our four cards. This randomized card positions method will continuously be called until the clear interval JavaScript method is executed from within the shuffle method. At this point, the positions of the cards should be unpredictable to the user. Okay, let's write a method named initialize card positions that contains the code to store the initial positions of the cards in the grid. The gameplay area within the card positions array. Let's call the initialize card positions method from within the create card method. So each initial position of the card is established when the game is first loaded through the relevant card elements ID. I want to create a method named deal cards that will execute when shuffle count equals 500 and therefore the deal cards method will be called after the shuffling or randomization of the card positions is complete. The deal cards method will in effect restore the grid to contain four grid cells and add each card back to their original positions in the grid. The div elements that make up the grid, i.e. the grid cells, will then have their positions within the grid altered in accordance with the random positions stored in the card positions array. This randomization of their positions was of course caused through the randomization functionality executed within the randomize card positions method. So let's create the deal cards method. Let's create a method named add cards to appropriate cell. Within this method, let's call the add card to grid cell method and pass in each card element to the add card to grid cell method within a loop that traverses all of the card elements. From within the deal cards method, let's call the add cards to appropriate cell method. So this will in effect restore the grid back to its original state with four cells and each cell containing a card element. The grid cells will at this point be in their original order. So now let's call a method named return grid areas mapped to card pause. This method will return a grid area template value containing a new positional configuration of the grid cells based on the randomized positions now stored in the card positions array. This randomization of positions was caused through the execution of the randomized card positions method called from within the shuffle method. Let's create the return grid areas mapped to card pause method. This method simply generates a grid area template that contains a new position configuration for the cells in the grid based on the random positions generated through our shuffle functionality stored within the card positions array. 
we can then transform the grid, as it were, to change the positions of the grid cells by assigning the grid the new grid area template value returned from the returned grid areas mapped to card parse method. Note that I'm using the back tick characters to envelop the value returned from the return grid areas mapped to card parse method. These characters allow us to interpolate a string by appropriately using the dollar symbol and curly brackets to wrap the relevant variables. I've included a link in the description for more detail on string interpolation in JavaScript. Let's comment out the call to the flip cards method so that we can see if the positions of the cards are being randomized by our shuffle functionality. Great. Let's uncomment the call to the flip cards method. So let's first remove all the borders and let's also remove the background colors from the grid cells and see what our game looks like. Great. Okay, so let's create functionality so that when a user makes a choice and clicks on the back of the card that the user believes to be the ace of spades, that the card that is chosen flips to the front and the user is made aware of whether the user's choice is correct or not. If the user's choice is correct, the user is awarded points depending on the relevant round number. If the user's choice is incorrect, the user is awarded no points. So we are now going to write the code that executes as a result of the user making a choice as to the card that the user believes to be the ace of spades. Let's first create a method named ChooseCard. Let's create a method named CanChooseCard, which will be called from within the ChooseCard method. There are certain states that the game will be in where we don't want the user to click on the back of the cards, for example, when the cards are being shuffled. So we don't want the choose card functionality executed while the shuffle process is in motion, as it were. So the can choose card method will return a Boolean value to the calling code to indicate to the calling code as to whether the game is in the right state where the choose card functionality can run. This expression is basically saying that if the game is in process and the shuffling process is not in progress and the cards are not in the process of being revealed, the expression returns true. When the expression returns true, the user is able to choose a card. When the expression returns false, the functionality in the choose card method will not be executed if a card is clicked. Let's declare and initialize the variables involved in the expression. We'll set the relevant values for these variables appropriately as we develop the game. The next functionality we want to express in code is the evaluation functionality. So the code we are about to write evaluates the user's choice. So let's write a method named evaluateCardChoice. 
This method is responsible for evaluating whether the card that the user chooses is the ace of spades or not. So let's first declare a global const and set its value to the ID of the ace of spades, which is 4. Let's write an if statement in order to evaluate whether the ID of the chosen card is equal to the ID of the ace of spades. In both cases, we want to output appropriate feedback to the user. If the user's choice is correct, we also want to update the score appropriately. We'll write the code for the update score method in a bit. So let's write a reusable method to output feedback to the user. So if the user hits the target as it were, output an appropriate message for a winning choice. Else output an appropriate message for a losing choice. Let's declare a global const that references the current status element. This is the element that is updated with status information dynamically through our code at appropriate points during a game. So let's go to our HTML code and create the current status element. If the user guesses the correct card, we want to output text in a green color. If the user guesses an incorrect card, we want to output text in a red color. Let's create a method named update status element. At times, we only want to make the current status element visible or invisible without updating the relevant element's text. So, if the calling code passes in only two arguments, we can set the display appropriately. However, if the calling code passes in more than two arguments, this indicates that the calling code wishes to update the text of the relevant element and possibly update the color of the element too. So this is a technique that we can use in JavaScript for method overloading. And of course the choose card method and the evaluate card method must include a card parameter. So Let's write the code for the update score method. The update score method calls the calculate score method. The calculate score method discovers, as it were, the number of points to add to the user's score through a call to the calculate score to add method. The number of points to add to the score depends on the round number. So if the round num variable is 1, add 100 points. If the round num variable is 2, add 50 points. If the round num variable is 3, add 25 points, else add 10 points. Let's declare and initialize three global variables. Round num, max rounds, although I think this should in fact be a const, and score. In the initialize new game method, let's set score to zero, round num to zero, and shuffle in progress to false. In the initialize new round method, let's increment the round num variable by one. Let's disable the gameplay button. Let's set the game in progress variable to true. 
and let's set the cards revealed variable to false. If you're not sure about the purpose of all these variables at the moment, this will become clear as we develop the game. So when a round is started, we want to update the status of the game in black text. Let's call the update status element and pass in the text shuffling dot dot dot. When a new round begins, the first thing that happens is the cards are shuffled. Let's go to our HTML file and add those elements responsible for outputting the score and round number to the user. I'm also including a logo image for the game in the same row as the score and round elements, which is just a stylistic choice. Let's create a global const to store the container element for the score. Let's create a global const to store the score element. Let's create a global const to store the container element for the round element. Let's create a global const to store the round element. When a new game is started, we want to make the score and round container elements visible. And we want to update the score and round elements with the appropriate values. When a new round is started, we want to update the round element appropriately. When a card is chosen by the user, we want the relevant card to flip to the front. So let's call the flip card method from within the choose card method. Then three seconds later, we want all of the cards to be revealed to the user so that the user can see where the Ace of Spades is, if the user did not guess where the Ace of Spades was correctly. So we are using JavaScript's setTimeout method to ensure that all the cards are flipped front side up 3000 milliseconds or three seconds after the user makes a guess. 
So in order for the choose card method to be executed in response to a user clicking the back of a card, we need to attach an appropriate event listener to each card element. Let's use JavaScript's add event listener method to ensure that our choose card method is called whenever a card is clicked. Let's run the code. So don't worry about the layout. I know the game logo here is huge. We'll address the layout and styling issues a little bit later. Okay, there seems to be a bug. Let's investigate. So the issue here is that I've referred to round as opposed to the correct variable name, which is round num. So this is an easy fix. So I need to make a few further modifications to the code to ensure that the choose card functionality works as expected. We need to set the shuffle in progress variable to false at this point in the code, i.e. this code executes once the shuffle process is completed. At this point, we also want appropriate output text shown to the user. Let's run the code. Great. So, to complete the choose card functionality, we need to execute appropriate code that tests to see if the final round, the fourth round, has been reached by the user. So let's write a method named end round. So let's use the set timeout function to ensure that if the game is not yet over, that the next round begins in three seconds. Or if the game is over, that appropriate output text is presented to the user and a new round is not started. So if the maximum round has been reached, it's game over. All rounds of the game have completed. Let's write a method named game over. So when it's game over, we want the score and the round number to be hidden and an appropriate game over output message to be displayed to the user. Notice how we are enveloping the relevant output in backtick characters. The backtick characters allow us to include what is known as template literals in our JavaScript code. 
If you'd like to read more about template literals, please see an appropriate link that I've included below in the description. Let's run the code. Okay, I guessed where the Ace of Spades is correctly, but the score hasn't been updated. So let's update the code so that when the score changes, the score element reflects this to the user. Excellent. So when the game is first loaded, we don't want the score and the round number elements displayed to the user. So let's update the code accordingly. Great. So we have pretty much completed the mechanics, if you like, for our game, but the layout and style certainly needs attention. So let's split our screen so that we can see our code editor next to our browser window. Let's go to our CSS file. So let's update the header element so that the display is flex and the flex direction is set to column. This positions its child elements one on top of the other as opposed to the default direction, which presents the elements next to each other on the same row. And let's give the margin bottom property a value of 10 pixels. Let's style the header-title-container element and use the Flexbox CSS functionality to center our heading text. Great.
So let's use the flex grid functionality for the display of the header-round-info-container element so that the image logo, the score, the round number are spaced evenly on the same row. We'll see the effect of this styling code a little bit later. So let's give all elements contained within the header-round-info-container element a width of 150 pixels. So let's horizontally and vertically center all of the elements contained within these elements by using the Flexbox functionality. So that ace of spades image you are currently seeing is of course way too big. So let's give it a height of 75 pixels. Great. Let's round the corners of the image logo by setting its border radius property appropriately. Let's add in a border Great. And let's give the image a box shadow. Excellent. Lastly, let's rotate the image minus three degrees. Great. That looks pretty good. Let's add some color related variables to our CSS file. Let's style the badge class so that our score and round number text stands out. Excellent. That play button really needs to be styled. So let's go to this URL where we have a selection of button styles to choose from. I like this one, so let's press the relevant button to copy the relevant CSS style code to our clipboards. Let's paste the code into our style.css file and update the code appropriately so that the relevant code relates to our play game button. Great.
I want to use a particular Google font for this application. So let's go to this URL here. And let's copy this sample code for importing a font into our application from within our CSS stylesheet file. Then let's appropriately update the relevant import code so that we are importing the quicksand font. Let's create a variable to reference the relevant font family value. Let's set the font family property of our body element to the variable that we have just created. Great. Let's make the font size for the current status element bigger. Great. Let's align the text for the current status element centrally. Great. The first animation I'd like to create is the shuffle animation. At the moment, during the shuffle process, the cards are stacked one on top of the other and are motionless. Let's create the illusion through our shuffle animation that the cards are literally being shuffled. Let's create a method named animate shuffle that contains a parameter. A numeric argument will be passed to this parameter, which will be a numeric value that is incremented for every time the shuffle function is called. Let's create code to generate two random numbers between one and four. Let's reference two cards of our four cards randomly through the two random numbers that we are generating in this method. Then we can modify the positions of the cards and the relevant card elements Z index properties through code like this. The mod function represented by the percentage character that I'm using in the first if statement means that when the result of the shuffle count value divided by four does not have a remainder, then code will execute to toggle the shuffle left class for the relevant card element. The mod function I'm using in the second if statement means that when the result of the shuffle count value divided by 10 does not have a remainder, then code will execute to toggle the shuffle right class for the relevant card element. The card elements are of course selected by our code at random. This will create the illusion that the computer is shuffling the cards. Let's write the code that calls the animate shuffle method from within the shuffle method. Let's create the CSS code for the shuffle left class. And the shuffle right class. And you can see that we are simply altering the positions of the cards through the shuffle left class and the shuffle right class. You can of course play around with the various settings related to the shuffle animation until you are happy with the animation effect. Once shuffling is completed, we want to make sure that none of the card elements contain the shuffle left class or the shuffle right class. And that shuffle effect is not happening. Right, so the reason is we need to include transition code for our card elements in the CSS file, like this. <laughs> 
And I think that is a pretty good shuffle effect, but please play around with the relevant values and see if you can create an even better shuffle effect. The next animation effect that I want to create is for when the game is first loaded. I want the cards to fly in from the top left hand side of the screen to their positions on the grid. Let's create a CSS class named flyin that will position the card elements appropriately off screen. When the flyin class is removed, through our JavaScript code, the card will move to its original position on the grid which ultimately results in a sort of fly-in effect. Let's create a method named card fly in effect that removes the fly-in class from the card elements at controlled time intervals. We are using the JavaScript set interval method to call the fly-in method at a predefined interval. Then we are further controlling when the fly-in class is removed from the relevant card element through the use of an if statement. We want the fly-in effect to be executed when our game is first launched. So let's call the fly in effect method from within the load game method. Let's add code so that the fly in CSS class is added to each card when each card is first created. So to do this, we can call code to add the fly in CSS class to the card element from within the create card method. Excellent. The last animation effect I'd like to create is, I want the gameplay button to not be visible when the game first loads, but then slowly fade in once the fly-in animation effect has completed. Let's include keyframe functionality within our CSS file that controls the opacity of the relevant element. Let's then add this animation to our play game button element like this. Let's initialize the gameplay button to be invisible when the game is first launched. Then let's set its display CSS property to inline block after the fly in animation effect completes. Great, but I want the height of the container to be static. So let's set the height of the gameplay button container element within our CSS file. I have also given this element a set width. Excellent. So I've created our game so that it looks pretty good on desktop screens. But what does our game look like on smaller screens? Like for example, what would our game look like on an iPhone 12? It looks pretty good as it is on smaller screens because we are using CSS Flexbox and grid functionality for the layout of our game. But we could improve our layout for smaller screens. So. To make our application layout responsive for smaller screens, 
let's include an appropriate media query within our CSS file. So we want certain CSS classes to be dynamically modified in response to a smaller screen size. So let's say that when our screen size is 600 pixels or less, we want our layout to respond in a certain way. At this smaller screen size, we can, for example, make our cards smaller like this. We can also adapt our card container element to respond appropriately to smaller screens with code like this. Let's make the height of the main element a bit smaller. Let's make the current status element a bit smaller. Let's make the gameplay button a bit smaller. And let's also make our game logo image a bit smaller. Let's check the responsiveness of our application through our Chrome browsers. Excellent. So our game is pretty much complete, but I'd like to include functionality so that if a user closes the browser for some reason before the user has completed a game, that the user is able to resume the same game when the game is launched at a later point in time. The way we are able to create this functionality is by using local storage. This allows us to persist data to our browser through our JavaScript code, when the browser is closed, the data stored in local storage is not lost and can be retrieved from local storage through JavaScript code at a later time when the relevant game or application is launched in the user's browser. So firstly, let's write a few reusable methods to abstract common local storage related functionality. So let's create a method named get serialized object as JSON. So we are going to persist an object to local storage in JSON format. So when we pass an object to this method, it will return a string value in JSON format 
that represents the object passed into this method. We will then be able to save the returned string to local storage. Let's create a method named getObject from JSON. When we read the JSON formatted string from local storage, we are going to want to convert the JSON string back into a JavaScript object so that we can use the object in our JavaScript code. Let's create a method named update local storage. This method saves a key value pair to local storage. You can see the first parameter is the key, which is the unique identifier for the value that will be passed into the second parameter, which will of course be a string in JSON format representing a JavaScript object. Let's create a method named remove local storage item. This method of course is used for removing a local storage item. Let's write a method named update game object. The object that we are going to persist to local storage contains the score and the round number pertaining to the relevant game. This method can be used to update the relevant game object. The game obj object where the score and the round number will be stored will have global scope. Then let's create a method that will handle saving the game obj object to local storage. Let's create a unique key to identify an incomplete game in local storage. Let's create a method named check for incomplete game. This method checks local storage for a unique key. If the relevant key exists in local storage, that means the user has data for an incomplete game saved to local storage. Oops, I forgot to create a helper method. Let's create a method that returns a value from local storage based on the key argument passed into this method. If the relevant local storage item exists, We want to ask the user if the user wishes to continue with the relevant unfinished game. So we are going to use the confirm JavaScript dialog for this purpose. If the user presses the OK button, then our code will update the game with the score and rounds number from the previous incomplete game saved to local storage. Else the score and rounds number will be initialized to zero which means the user has chosen to start a new game. So let's call the check for incomplete game method from within the initialize new game method. Let's write the code that saves the data pertaining to a game after the user has selected a card. Let's test the code. Excellent! If you liked this video, please hit the like button and please feel free to share this video with anyone you feel may benefit from its content.
For content like this and much more, please consider subscribing and please ring the bell so that you'll be notified of future content. If you'd like to thank me by buying me a coffee, I've included a link to my Buy Me A Coffee webpage. Any support will be greatly appreciated. The code created in this tutorial can be downloaded from GitHub. Please see the URL for the relevant GitHub repository below in the description. Thank you and take care.